Okay, so like the maple example last week, uh, we got some trail side cousins right here in the oak family. Notice these leaves. Look at the way the veins run. Look at what they call the margins. Look at the rounded teeth. Check out the underside color and texture. And then go nearby. And then we have this oak. Check out the difference. Texture, the leaves. Look at the margin. Bit more of a waxy underside. See that in the light, maybe? Those are little distinguishing features that when you go ahead and use a, a guidebook, you can figure out what they are. Now I'll have to double check myself, but I believe the one on the left right here is white oak more common in southern Maine, I believe, than in northern Maine. And the one on the right here, more common throughout the state, is red oak. They're really smashing me. Probably worthwhile to riff on it since last week I mentioned it in the description of my video about the black flies. If you're responsible for a group outing, whether it's just you and a loved one, you in your classroom, or if you're a guide or instructor, you gotta be aware of these environmental factors. Although I don't think mosquitoes are evil, they definitely suck when you're getting mobbed by them. And of course, some people are concerned about diseases being spread through them. So be a good trip leader, be a good guide, prepare. Today I wore longer clothing. If I wanted to be more comfortable, I could have brought a mosquito net for my head, or just some kind of repellent. One of the cool things about learning plan identification is you don't actually need to know what you're doing. I still come out and there's so much that I don't know. For example, I just was walking along the trail here. These little teeny purplish pinkish blooms caught my eye. So I came up to them, checking them out in detail, checking out the stem. Got a pretty interesting flower. And so I'm just going to look at this thing and check out the details. Kind of soft stem, is it bristly? No. What does the underneath of the leaf look like? What's the bloom look like? What time of year is it flowering? This is called sweet fern. Now it's not actually a fern, but you, from earlier you can see the leaf patterns. The general leaf shape looks exactly like a fern. So sweet fern, this is a great one. You'll see this all over the place in what we'd call disturbed soil. Now disturbed just kind of means opened up and there's ways of naturally disturbing ground like a wildfire or some kind of catastrophic weather that tears up the uh, flesh of the earth. In other cases, it might just be railroad tracks or a power line, a parking lot. But along the edge here is this sweet fern and it grows along these woody, semi-woody stems. And the best thing about it is if you just touch it, and then you smell your hand, it's got a really nice floral scent to it. Um, just another great way to start integrating senses with your students or yourself. You're using your sense of smell and touch, and you're using that to distinguish this plant, let's say, from, you know, something that looks somewhat similar right over here. This plant's also on a stemmy pith. Um, it's got somewhat similar leaves but it's not the same. You don't really have much of an eye for this stuff or if you're a young child. Um, picking this stuff, crushing it in your hand, giving it a smell, you're gonna get that signal that you're not doing the right thing.
is called Pink Ladies Slipper. Now if you hold it sideways like that, it kind of looks like a ballet slipper or a, another slipper. Front's got this orchid look to it. Pretty cool. The leaves, they're kind of hairy. I don't know if you can see that on camera. They have really obvious veins, about five or so vein, main veins coming out of the bottom. All the leaves come out of the bottom, which is also referred to as basil, B-A-S-A-L. But one thing I noticed, I noticed this little one right here, not too far away, but still hidden from view. Here's another one, and here's another one. Here's two more. Here's a bunch of babies, not flowering yet, but poking their heads out. I don't know what it is, but I find wildflowers super fascinating. These ones are just hidden away in the woods. Here's more. And flowers are just so uh, temporal. They only last for a minute in the big picture before they start to do this and wilt. So we're in a bit of a forest clearing right here, and this could be a good example of disturbed habitat. Notice all this sweet fern in this thicket forming a nice pocket. These plants are reaching towards the sun, filling this gap and holding this soil in place with a nice strong root mat. And around it you have a bunch of pioneer species of tree. Here's the state tree of Maine right here, a young white pine. Now it's chosen as the state tree for many reasons, but what I like to think of is this tree that can recolonize an area. If I go over here to the right, here's some bigger examples. These are more like teenagers. And then way up on the top, you have these oaks. These look like red oaks from where I'm standing. But they are the two tallest most trees and that is kind of their role in nature, uh, is a pinnacle species. They get mature and bigger and stronger and they play the long game. Oaks can live easily for three or 400 years or more. There's examples in the United States of them living up to seven or 800 years, I believe. Cut back to our humble pine though. Like a 100 years ago, the state was more deforested than it is. There's actually more tree cover now than there was like a century ago when we were heavily logging most of the state. So this tree is responsible for the comeback. Um, when everything was stripped away, these pines get nice and tall, like these bigger ones are on their way. These guys will stretch up and over and they will compete with these other canopy species. And when that pine cone, that white pine cone, which I can cut to now, sends its leaves with little winged tips to catch the wind and sail over the terrain and land in these pockets where it shoots up again. It's an awesome plant engine uh, meant to just reforest terrain rapidly. Super cool. I find inspiration in those kind of plant dynamics. I find inspiration in ecology. I think those dynamics can instruct us in a lot of other areas of life and it's one of the ways nature education overlaps with other stuff and is why I believe it's such a fundamental part of human development. One quick thing I want to go over here, white pine is one of the most common pines in the state, but there are others. Red pine's fairly common too. It tends to be in plantations where they've reforested areas. But one cool thing I liked about the difference between white and red, let's say, is if you get in close here, you should be able to see that all these, these needles emerge from one point. So if I pluck one of those off and I put it in the light here and I spread them out with white pine, think of the word white, which has five letters in it. The white pine, every bundle of tassels has five tassels in it, which is a helpful reminder. Red pine, which we'll get to later, has three needles per bundle. Since we're talking about pioneers, another great one. See in this little thicket of woods, you have one tree that's very common. This lets us know that this area was, in relative terms, 
recently reforested. This area was probably cut down within the last 20 years or so. Another pioneer species is white birch. I believe it's Betula papyrifera. White birch, very common throughout the state. Doesn't get very big. This is a tree that's meant to fill gaps. The old saying is nature abhors a vacuum. Nature does not want empty space. It wants to reclaim that space. It wants to put as many species in there and get that energy and resources cycling and trapped within the carbon cycle, within the water cycle, within the cycles that ecology creates to preserve resources against entropy. Maybe one of the lesser known things about it is it creates a sap that is similar to sugar maple. It's a sap that you can boil for syrup or you could have it just for a sweet drink. It runs in the late winter slash really early spring. Um, you could tap this just like you could a maple. The other thing is most Mainers know this and other people from northern states, but white birch bark is like a cheat code for fire starting. This is an example of a naturalized plant. Right now it's only in flower. Notice the leaves up close. They're almost speckled. They've got a bit of a silvery haze and underneath they're even lighter. Speckled on top, lighter on bottom. This is some something in the genus Eleagnus. It's quite a cool edge species. It might be considered a pest in some places, but I love this plant. It forms red berries, which I can show a picture of. There's a lot of birds in the area that have taken to eating it, uh, so they find it as another resource. One thing about edges, and if you look right here, we're on an edge. To the left, I have forest, and on the right, I have this like grassland. It almost looks like a savanna. You got some perennial shrubs with the sweet fern. You got some trees over here, and then you have the uh, gravel pit. So we are along an edge. And one of the cool relationships that's revealed, you might not see anything that cool right here. One of the ways we can build an eco-literacy is seeing the relationships between plant and animal on these edges. So I happen to know this shrub forms some delicious red berries. The reason plants do that is an evolutionary strategy to get their seeds spread along the edge here. I see another one. Behind this tipped over aspen, there's one. Here's another one. There's another one. up close. It actually has a leaf that's similar to poison sumac. We don't have a lot of poison sumac in Maine, but it exists. This is actually called staghorn sumac, and it is not poisonous. It will not give you any kind of rash. The reason it's called staghorn sumac, if you look up close here, is it's fuzzy like an antler towards the new growth. It's a cool little tree. It reminds me of something from somewhere like Africa. I don't know why. It's got some savanna sort of look. You can see the silhouette of the leaves right now, shadowed out. And it's a great native species to grow along disturbed edges. It's been planted intentionally to hold roadside because it grows together in a thicket like this. All of this is sumac. Forms a tight root cluster and it can hold this little hill right here. It can hold this together 